Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. I've entitled my message this morning, God is with us, and an exclamation mark. God is with us. Amen. Would you stand as we read the word this morning? Psalmist David, he's writing and he asks us a question here. He says, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And both of those are questions. Then he says, if I ascend up into heaven, hmm, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, he said, behold, you're there too. <laughs> he said, if I would take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Or even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night sh shall be as light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light both are alike to thee. Amen. God is with us. I'm going to be few minutes getting to the text this morning uh, with my preamble it's going to be a, a little bit longer or the prelude introduction and so uh, if any Bible school students here this morning and you were taught homiletics the portions of my message are all out of proportion <laughs> they tell us you know an introduction to be short only so so long compared to the rest of the message my introduction is going to be the longest part this morning they want to get into the scripture here I won't be long when I get there so uh, bear with me this morning. I want as a theme the, the uh, omnipresence of God. What do we mean by the omnipresence? It's one of his attributes, meaning he's everywhere present and nowhere's absent. Now that's a wonderful saying. And you have probably quoted it before. It's one thing to say it, another thing to see it on paper. And yet so much different to believe it in your heart and to experience it in your life. Amen. I serve an omnipresent God. God is with me. Amen. Lord, this morning we pray that your presence would be here in a special way as we try to put across this thought today. Lord, you're ever with us every moment of every day, no matter where we are or on the face of this globe. You're there. And Lord, we just reach out and be aware of your presence this morning. Be near about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I will tell you in a few minutes how the message came to me, and then I want to talk somewhat about the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. When we get to the Ark of the Covenant, how the, the testimony of the enemies concerning that Ark the testimony of Uzzah, if he were alive to tell you, and the testimony of Obed-Edom about the blessings of God. And then we're going to skip ahead in time to a body that was prepared for God to inhabit, Emmanuel, God with us, bringing right up to present day the baptism of the Holy Ghost for you and I. How does that spirit get on the inside of us, that presence of God? And then we get to the scriptures that we read this morning, the presence of God, a statement there, and then the extent of his presence. And when we get to the extent of his presence in the uh, three, or, or in the scripture verse that we read to you there, there's three things there that's contrasting extreme statements. There's the high and the low, the fastest and farthest, and the light and the darkness. Then we're going to conclude with a statement, and uh, hopefully you can take something away from the the uh, church house this morning that will feed your soul. I already been mentioned we were in Halifax this week, and uh, I didn't take a lot of, uh, let's see, sermon preparation material, whatever, with me. And but I do have my cell phone, which has a Bible on it, reading and whatnot. But uh, it was on that first night, and I actually was in the shower, and somehow the thought came to me that I need to pray for my superintendent. Terry Brewer. So I was praying with him there, and then I was reminded of him telling me, and this has been quite a few years ago, he said, Brother Taylor, should I remember the first message that I ever heard you preach? 
said it was in my home church, which was Zealand. And uh, I remember that well, and I remember the message. And so I told him what it was, and he concurred with me, yes. And it was the ark of God. God is with me. He was just a young boy in Zealand at the time, so that's been a number of years ago. But from then until now, I want to tell you that the truth of God's word, the truth about the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence has not changed down through the years. And my God is still alive and as real to me today as he was back then. So there's a theme today, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. This was the uh, visible manifestation of God's presence among the children of Israel that they could see from day to day. If I could put it this way, God confined himself to a box, so as to speak. Now, I'm thankful he's not confined to a box today, all right? Can you imagine David of old, the psalmist there, getting excited? I mean, real excited, right beside himself over a box. Yeah, I read in the scriptures how David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And you know where he was dancing? It was down the house of Obedium. They were bringing the ark back up to its rightful place in Jerusalem. And here was what he conceived to be the presence of God. He was in front of it. And he said he danced with all of his might. He got real excited about being where that box was. Real excited. Okay? Now, uh. David tried to convince the people, the Israelites, and of course they knew it, that this box that they were looking at, the Ark of the Covenant, represented the presence of God. So as long as they could see that box, then uh, God was present with them. It's in our possession. God is with us. Especially not only the box, the mercy seat that sat on top of it. That's where the Lord was to commune with their leader, Moses. And uh, they had it made as long as that box was in their presence. This Ark of the Covenant, this box that God sort of confined, confined himself to, was a curse to the enemy. Do you remember when it was not in its rightful place? Rather, the uh, enemy had captured the children of Israel and their god Dagon, they put this box in their temple beside their image god Dagon and they get up the next day and here Dagon was on his face before the box and that wasn't enough for them they set Dagon upright again and they come back the next day and he's fallen down again in front of the box and his arms and his legs are severed from that image and he was just left a stump no limbs uh, it, it became a curse to the enemy the ark was not where it should be. It became a curse to the enemy. Then that box became judgment upon those that knew better. For instance, Uzzah. It was decided they need to uh, return the ark to the Israelites. And so uh, David actually went down and to the house. Of, they were going to bring it up to the house of Abinadab. And as they were going over the threshold uh, of the threshing floor and they had placed this box that God confined himself to uh, on an ox cart and going through the threshing floor and the thing rocked and Uzzah put his hand out to stay the ark and he was smitten dead. Now Uzzah knew better because uh, to the children of Israel the ark was to be carried from place to place in a special way. It was the Levites, and it was to be carried on the shoulders, and it wasn't to be upon an ox cart. And so those to, that know better about the presence of God and him confined to a box and how he's supposed to be carried and handled, uh, if it's not that way, the closer that you get to the presence of the Lord, the more severe the judgment. And this is what happened to Uzzah. So we find out he's a curse to the enemy. He's judgment to Uzzah. Over Bedidim, he's got a different testimony about this box, this ark, this presence of God. Uh, see, David, he got a little bit miffed, if I could use that word, a little bit upset with God for the breach upon Uzzah. And so he turns aside and he leaves the ark in the house of Obedidim. And 
And David returns to his city, and he's a little bit, uh, uh, just a little bit mad and can't understand why God uh, judged one of his own, and now he's dead. But he hears within the next three months down there at the house of obed it's blessing after blessing after blessing. Three months of blessing the house of obed and David said, well, I think I'll go back down there and make another attempt to bring the ark, that box, the presence of God back to Jerusalem where it ought to be. And he instructed his people, he said, when we go after the box, when we go after the presence of the Lord to bring it home, this time we need to do it right. If we do it right, it'll be a blessing to us as it is to Obed-Edom. We won't be judged like Uzzah was judged. It won't be a curse to us like it was to Dagon and the Ashdodites. And so they go down to the house of Obedim to fetch the ark and to bring it back to its rightful position. And David has got the box and it's on the shoulders of the priests and they start to march and they didn't get very far. It was only six paces. He said, stop, folks. Let's hold, hold up here just for a minute. In doing it right... Six paces, I think it's time for me, King David, uh, to stop this procession and to begin to dance before the Lord. And the scripture says that he danced before the Lord with all his might. I mean, he got beside himself. He was excited about the presence of God returning to its rightful place. And of course, if the king is the only one that's getting with the program, he would look quite conspicuous. And conspicuous he did look. For when they came to the city, I mean every six paces this was happening. And when he came to the city, his wife looked out the window. His name was Michael. And it says she despised him in her heart. Thought, there's my husband out there acting like an idiot. And of course, uh, people have some opinions about us too in the way that we worship. Maybe it looks strange to them and they don't understand some things. And they say all manner about us. But you know what? It's those that have no spiritual inclinations at all. David may have looked like he was making a fool of himself, but that was in Michael's eyes and in her opinion and acting ridiculous. And she thought this is a luxury that he can't afford. He's disgracing the dignity of his royal and kingly office. But her opinion was strictly a fleshly, carnal point of view with not an ounce of spirituality in her. Let's fast forward from the Ark of the Covenant, this box that represented the presence of God in the Old Testament, that box that was a curse to the enemies and judgment to those that knew better and blessings to those that were handling it rightly. Let's fast forward and come ahead some 2,000 years. And we arrive at Scripture where the scripture says, and I'm sorry I didn't put a reference in for this, a body hast thou prepared me. What do we mean? Uh, you are familiar in Matthew where it, it says, Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's no longer a box. Now it's a body. A body hast thou prepared me, a babe in Bethlehem's manger. God made flesh or God's dwelling place among us, Emmanuel, God with us. In doing so, in, in uh, God becoming flesh and robing himself in flesh, I can tell you this morning that Jesus is God. Jesus is God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I went real fast on that section. I'm going to fast forward again some more. Another 2,000 years and we arrive at, at the day of Pentecost, or, or even 2,000 years since today. There's no box here today that I can point to and say <laughs> the presence of God is confined to that space right there. There's no physical body, whether it's a babe or a grown-up, that you can point to and say, well, there's where the Lord has confined himself, and he's there today. Matter of fact, we could go to the graveyard down here if we want to, and Look for a tomb, but he's not there either. And you know the tomb that they put the body of Jesus into, that there was Mary and there was Peter and John, there was 500, and then there was the disciples, and there were several witnesses that the body was not in that tomb. 
Amen. He's risen again, isn't he? So you're not going to find him in a box. You're not going to find him in a single physical body, so as to speak. You're not going to find him in the tomb. Rather, I'd like to make a bold statement here this morning. You say, what's that? The Lord Jesus Christ abides in me. God is with me. Now, I'm not the only one he's with. All right, so don't let, I didn't see too many eyebrows raised there this morning when I made the declaration that God is on the inside of me. Some of you might think, oh boy, really, who does he think he is? Now, when I mention that God is on the inside of me, that's something I should be able to get excited about. Excited enough to maybe dance like David danced? <laughs> get beside himself? The almighty, powerful God is on the inside of me. Now, if you could realize what I'm trying to tell you this morning, <laughs> I'm wired greater than 220. Because all power is on the inside of me. All power is on the inside of you. You might look at me strange this morning. The power is there, but it's like the 220 electric motor that's not hooked up to a source. What good is any electric motor, 110, 220, 750, if it's not hooked up? <laughs> It's just sitting there. It's got a lot of potential, but it's not doing anything. I want to tell you the power of the Almighty resides inside of us. Let not that power go to waste or be lightened. Let's put it to good use. So know this morning I'm not looking for a box. I'm not looking to see uh, a body of Jesus Christ or a tomb uh, what I'm looking for this morning is to see the Lord inside of me and on the inside of you. Now, some are looking at me this morning when we say that God is on the inside of me. You look real impressed just like Michael. You say, what do you mean? Uh, if you don't have any spiritual inclinations this morning, you don't understand. <laughs> Amen. About God on the inside of me and why I get happy and why I get excited and why I like to worship and to praise and to sing is because there's something living, real, and alive on the inside of me. Amen. So hopefully you don't think I'm crazy when I tell you the Lord is with me and on the inside of me. More than a box, more than Emmanuel, more than a babe in a tomb, or, or a crucified Lord in a tomb. It's God on the inside of me. How did he get there anyway? I want to share a scripture with you this morning. I know as Pentecostals we pride ourselves in Acts chapter 2, 1 through to 4, and verse 38, the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. That's an awesome experience. But let's look at Colossians 2 and 12 here. And see what it says. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. How did God get on the inside of me? It was an operation. Now you're thinking doctor's table cut with a knife. <laughs> no, not that kind of an operation, but it was the doings. It was the workings of God. All right, that put the spirit on uh, the inside of me. Now, that's quite an operation. No, there was no local anesthesia to put me to sleep <laughs> like he did to Adam, right, when he made Eve. This spirit of God came on the inside of me. I was wide awake when it happened. And somebody wrote a song, and, and, and I love it. it. says, I was there when it happened, and I guess I ought to know. <laughs> I was there when Jesus saved me, the very moment he forgave me. He took my every burden, and he gave me sweet peace within. Satan can't make me doubt it. It's real, and I'm going to shout it. I was there when it happened. I guess I ought to know. 
It was the operation of God filling me with his presence. That's how he got on the inside of me. No, I didn't eat the baby Jesus. Right? Not a cannibal. That's not how he got on the inside. <laughs> it was the operation of God. And so I can stand here today and tell you that God is with me 24-7. And I can quote to you scriptures that he will never leave me nor forsake me, as the psalmist David said. Or to the apostles, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. David again, though an host should encamp against me, and this will I be confident. You're my light in my salvation, in whom shall I trust? Oh, I'm telling you, the Lord is my strength. He's my shield. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer, my high tower, my defense. He's my refuge and a haven from the storm, a pavilion I can run into. He's with me 24-7. David said, in my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. God was present with him. Everywhere present, nowhere's absent. Not just as a statement, not something you can just read on paper. It was an experience to David. It wasn't God in a box. It was God on the inside. Amen. Now, that's quite a message, isn't it? That's my introduction. That was pretty long. <laughs> Haven't got to my text yet, have I? <laughs> All right, let's go to the text. I want to show you what we have seen here. Two parts to this text in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, he makes a statement about his presence, and then from there on he shows us the extent of his presence by some contrasting statements there. So start off in verse 7, if you could bring that back up on the screen again, please. In Psalm 139, verse 7, he makes a statement, a couple of statements, and with questions here. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? I, I, my imagination runs wild here. Flee from his presence. It sounds like someone's trying to get away from God. Where can you go where you can get away from him? If he's everywhere present and nowhere is absent. No place. I can't imagine anyone wanting to escape from God's presence. You know, I've seen some people try. <laughs> whether it's refusing to come to the house of God where they perceive his presence to be. <laughs> right, Brother Hal? <laughs> Amen. Man was supposed to be with him this morning. He made all manner of excuses not to come. He's afraid the presence of God will be here. Ah, come on. <laughs> all right, the presence of God. Afraid something might happen. God's spirit is gentle. Amen. It won't hurt you nor harm you. Uh, we shouldn't try to get away from the presence of God or try to flee from his presence. I look back clear to the beginning. There was a couple, the first couple that was ever uh, invented, made, or whatever word you want to use to, to describe it, Adam and Eve. They tried to escape, to flee, to hide from God's presence. But there was a reason for it. They had sinned. They felt guilty. Their conscience was, and that's why people try to get away from the presence of God is when there's sin in their life. Well, what's the big deal about that? Because God has a way of dealing with sin. <laughs> and if you don't want him to deal with your sin, then you just try to keep running and hiding from him. Adam and Eve were not the only one that tried to flee from the presence of God and hide. I look at Jonah, a preacher. <laughs> Call of God to go to a certain places. I don't want to go. <laughs> he went the opposite direction, but the Lord had a way of dealing with him. He couldn't hide. He couldn't escape because God was with him wherever he went. Amen. And David makes the statement here in the form of a question: Where would I flee from the presence? Not presence. Not that he would want to. He was just asking the question there because he knew that God was on that present. Everywhere present, nowhere's absence. And it wouldn't matter if you went up high or went down low. You can't flee away from God's presence. He's everywhere. 
God as an infinite spirit free from all limitations. He's holy, everywhere present, all over the world, at the same time filling heaven and earth and all that's therein. He's everywhere present. He's nowhere absent. I pray that you can get a hold of that this morning as more as a statement or something you read on paper that you can get a hold of it as an attribute and a doctrine and something you believe with all your heart and have experienced as well. Look at how Jeremiah expressed it in Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. He said, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, or not? And not a God afar off. In other words, I'm close, but not far away. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth? Saith the Lord. There he is, omnipresent. You can't get away from him. Amen. Whether you're in a right standing, whether you're an enemy, or whether you're doing what's right, he's still at hand. Everywhere present and nowhere's absent. He fills heaven and earth, so he's omnipresent. Reminded a little story I heard this a while back. A young, an older gentleman tried to discourage a young boy in his faith, and he said, young man, he said, uh, I'll give you a dime if you can tell me where God is. And the boy, as quick as a flash, turned around and said, hey, sir. How would I give you a dollar if you can tell me where he isn't? <laughs> wow, that was a good answer, wasn't it? <laughs> because he is everywhere present and he is nowhere's absent. So uh, he makes a statement here, uh, whether shall I flee or escape from his presence? We just cannot do it. He is everywhere. Then the second portion there in verses 8 through 12. Psalm 139 there again, verses 8 through 12. After making the statement that he's everywhere present, nowhere is absent, you can't flee from him, notice now what he says. If I ascend up into heaven, wow, you're there. <laughs> or if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Now, we can comprehend the height of God this morning. Yeah, he's up in heaven, but... Hell, maybe that's a different, but that's the way David expressed it in a contrasting phrase here. In other words, he's going to be ever with me and just won't let, uh, uh, let me loose. And so the highest or the lowest, he's still there. I believe it's Mount Everest that's the highest point on the earth or in this Western culture, whatever, uh, some 30,000 feet in the air. If you go up there, he's there. If you could be a diver and a swimmer and go below the water <laughs> and find the lowest water, he's still there. All right? You can't get away from his presence. So it's high and low. He's still there. I, I'm reminded, I don't know if it was the first space trip or not. One of the astronauts actually made this statement, and it was aired one time. He said, from my spacecraft, I looked out. He said, I didn't see God anywhere. If I could come face to face with that astronaut, I would tell him, all you had to do was open the door and jump, and you'd have met him in a hurry. <laughs> Amen, all right. <laughs> Amen. Uh, he didn't see God anywhere, I'll tell you. Maybe he just didn't open his eyes. Because according to the word of God, he's everywhere. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech. I mean, you see him in everything. So whether it's high, as high as you go, or as low as you go, you cannot get away from the presence of the Lord. Then he goes on in uh, another statement here. He's the fastest and the, the farthest. By fastest, talking about the sun rising in the morning. Let's continue reading here. If I take the wings of the morning, wings of the morning, can you imagine the sun rising in the east? And I believe if I'm right in my science education, the sun uh, rises and the speed of light is something like 180,000 miles a second and that it rises to get here to the earth. Hmm. Suppose I can outrun him. 
I mean, if you can't go high and get away from her low, go, you're not going to outrun him either. We know that the speed of light is very fast, but you can't run that fast. You're not going to get away from God, whether it's the rising of the sun or the morning. And then he goes on and says, or if I dwell in the uttermost parts or across the farthest distance away on the other side of the sea even. So when he was talking about high and low, that's vertical. Now he's talking about horizontal, east and west. There's no way that you can get away from the presence of the Lord. And so that's the fastest and the farthest. Then he continues on. There's another statement he makes here about the lightest and the darkest. Let's continue on with that one. Or even there shall thy hand lead me. He's talking about the, uh, the, the sea there. This side of the sea, the other side of the sea. He said, your hand is going to be there to hold me. Can't get away from his friends. Can't escape. Everywhere present, nowhere is absent. All right? If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Isn't there a scripture that says God is light? Now, if he's light and he's everywhere presence, the light or the darkness is as light to him. Now, I can't comprehend that because I'm human. But he's on a different level than I, right? He's God. The darkness and the light is, is the same to him. Now, there's people that love darkness. I believe I put a scripture verse in here for that. Yes, John 3, verse 19. John 3, 19, if we could just bring that up for a moment. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness. Why did they love darkness rather than the light? Because their deeds were evil. And there's a lot of evil that happens in the dark. I think there's a comprehension among humanity that if I can just get in the darkness, God can't see me. Hey, the darkness is as light to God. He sees as good in the night as he does in the day. He's got cat's eyes. <laughs> Not really, if you understand what I'm saying there. <laughs> cat can see in the dark. You can't. All right. He's not limited by our human senses. And then there's another thing about the darkness when it comes to man. How many of us sitting here today would confess at one time or another, whether it's a child or even now as an adult, that you're afraid of the dark? <laughs> no, no one's going to confess to that. Well, let me tell you a story about a little lad that was. A little lad who was very afraid of the dark, and it was bedtime, and he had his snack at bedtime, and he spilled some milk, and his mother said, I want you to go get the mop and clean it up. The mop happened to be out on the porch, and he's scared of the dark. So he eased his way to the door and opens the door, and he sticks his head in and says, God, he said, if you're out there, bring me the mop. <laughs> he was afraid of the dark. We don't need to be afraid of the dark when the Lord Jesus is with us. Amen. And he is with us. What am I saying there? He takes away our fears. I believe it was last Sunday morning when Dylan was preaching, he mentioned fear, and I know that there was different ones here in the congregation that responded to that, said that they were ministered to. God is our refuge and strength, our high tower, our refuge, our provision, whatever we need him to be. There's no need to be afraid when he's with us. He's light, and even the darkness, he's light to us. He is with us. I'd like to close with this scripture this morning, it's a familiar portion of scripture, Psalm 23 and verse number 4. Are you aware of what this says? Here's the psalmist David again. Yea, he says, though I would walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. God is with us. Amen. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's not in a box this morning. He's not in a babe or even in an adult body or in a tomb. He's in you and I today. I trust that he's in his rightful place in our life. If he's not in the rightful place, it might look like judgment to us or it might look like a heavy hand upon us. 
I want him to be blessing at all times. Well, if he's going to bless us, then he needs to be in his rightful place. So I trust you've got the point this morning. God is with us. More than a statement that you can read on paper, more than just a saying, hopefully it is an experience where he has come on the inside of you through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the operation of God, and now he's with you 24-7. If I could close with this statement this morning and not be misunderstood, <coughs> I'm the box. <laughs> You're the box. What do you mean? You are the dwelling place of God. He's with us 24-7. Would you stand this morning? Let's do as our custom is on Sunday morning here at Nashville Valley. We're going to sing a chorus this morning. The word of God has gone forward. Let's come forward today and either stand or kneel at this altar and let the word of God sink in. God is with me. Amen. What shall I fear? What shall I fear? Amen. God is with me. What shall I fear? Amen. Would you come this morning?